Good evening, and you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, which has been brought to you tonight by the advisory staff here in County Mayo. My name is Brendan Gary, and I work in Chagas and Ballon Rope. And tonight, for the next hour, I'm delighted to be your host for this evening's webinar. Now, this evening's webinar is the first episode in a new four part series of webinars, which will run throughout the month of February, each Wednesday night at 8 pm. And the same link will work for each episode. Now, during this new series, we'll cover some of the key agricultural issues facing Irish farmers, including a detailed examination of the new direct payment regime, which comes into force this spring, examining the new national reserve and the new complementary income support scheme for young farmers. And we'll also review the, the latest changes to the nitrates rules, along with discussing the new suckler carbon efficiency program and providing an update on water quality and the new acre scheme. However, tonight the focus switches to preparing for lambing. And as we know, mid-season flocks are approximately five to six weeks out from lambing. And tonight our two presenters will discuss some of the key issues in getting ready for lambing. Our first speaker tonight will be Liam Quinn from Chagas and Westport. And Liam will give us an update on the guidelines in relation to yo nutrition pre-lambing. While later my colleague James Fitzgerald from Chagas and Ballinay will discuss some of the key items to consider at lambing time. And James will also talk to us about the new sheep improvement scheme, which was just launched there before Christmas and many farmers have applied for this scheme. So James will tell us what farmers now need to do. Now you, the viewers, are being encouraged to engage with our speakers here tonight. And we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your phones, screens or tablets. And later this evening, uh, Vivian Silk, the Chagas Regional Manager here for County Mayo, will put your questions live to our panellists. So please type your questions into the Q&A box. Now, as always, this webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back on our Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. So without further delay, I'm now going to ask you, Liam, to start sharing your presentation with us. And it's over to you now, Liam. So uh, thanks, uh, My name is Liam Quinn and I'm based in the Chagas office in Westport. And tonight I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the nutrition of yours in their pregnancy. So we're heading into that time of year again when the focus turns to nutrition. So uh, just, just to recap on nutrition. So just an overview then, I'm going to look a little bit tonight about body condition scoring and the importance of it and what to look for when your body condition scoring yours. Um, later size and lambing date, you know, determined by um, scanning um, silage and ration quality. So hugely important when it comes to pre lambing nutrition. Classroom production, you know, key driver, that will be a uh, soybean meal for protein and then checking for uh, optimum nutrition. So how you know if your nutrition actually worked. So why is nutrition so important? So what we're trying to achieve really is we're, we're trying to maximize the amount, the amount of lambs that we have for sale and reduce mortality as much as possible. So mortality stands at about 12 percent across farms, but we're trying to get that a little bit lower if we can at all. Um, and then, of course, if you have more lambs for, for, for sale, um, it's more profit at the end of the year. Classroom production, then, hugely important. Um, driver, uh, a soybean again. And then optimal birth and live weight gain. So we want to have lambs at optimal birth weights. We don't want to have them too light, where uh, they're more susceptible to hypothermia and that. And then we don't want them too big either because, you know, it's going to lead to problems at lambing. And then live weight gains, we want the lambs gaining weight every day that they're on the farm so that they're off to a good start as soon as they hit the ground and um, they're gaining from every day. So we're trying to reduce labor requirements then as much as possible. That goes back to your, your optimal birth weights. You don't want lambs too big or, you know, you're going to increase labor requirements at a time where labor is already very high. So body condition scoring. So Body condition score uh, management of it is key in the lead up to, to, to lemming. The range uh, is one to five, but we're targeting a body condition score of three, especially for, for lowland flocks. For hill flocks, then, uh, like you see on the right here, kind of uh, 2.5 would be the, the mark for a body condition score. It's just important to note that it takes eight weeks to build one conditional body score. So, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And if you take that yo, uh, it's 11 to 14 percent of yo's body weight. So if you had a 50 kilo yo, that's six kgs that she has to put on. You know, it takes time to do that. Uh, we want to avoid loss of body condition score in late pregnancy. So it's hard to put on body condition score um, in late pregnancy. But uh, it's very easy to lose it because there's huge requirements on the yo's. 
Just another important point, if the yo doesn't have condition on her back when she lambs down, then she's going to put her reserves back into herself rather than back into her lambs, which is what you want her to do. So it's hugely important to have it correct. How to body condition score then? As you can see on the left here, uh, the sheep are up the race and the farmer is uh, checking them for body condition score. So where is he looking? He's looking along. He or she is looking along the top of the tail head. And if it's very... Uh, Prominent, uh, if you can feel the spine, then it's a sign that the O is under condition. Then um, the transverse process as well. So just between the hip and the rib, uh, there's an area there that you can check. You know, if there's bones coming down from the spine, if they're very uh, prominent, it's a sign that the O is under condition as well. And then um, the muscle then as well. So you don't want any hollow at the muscle, at the eye muscle. You want the, the muscle to be good and filled. And just from the slide here, you can see the picture in the middle is the condition score of EO at three. And the EO on the right is a condition of a score score of 4.5 to 5. So you can see there's, that, there's fat actually bulging on the EO on the right, which is not what you want. So litter size and lambing date, hugely important as well, huge important step in uh, um, nutrition, or your nutrition, sorry. Um, scanning is key to determine your litter size. So you want to see if the O's are carrying singles, doubles, or triplets, and you're going to pin them accordingly then as well. Lambing date, hugely important, so you know when to start feeding your O's from. So it's usually 68 weeks out from lambing, so it's important to know the date. Scanning is key in identifying barren yaws. So if yaws aren't carrying lambs, you don't want to be feeding those yaws. Scanning will determine them and you can pull them out and remove them from the system or treat them separately, whichever you want to do. And then we're targeting 80 to 90 days post ram turnout and scanning. So that's when your scanning is, is most accurate. And before 80 days, your scan will be less accurate. And likewise, then after 90 days, it'll be less accurate as well. So you can see from the graph here and um, the days of gestation on the bottom, so in the pregnancy and then the weight of the lambs. And you can see in early and mid-pregnancy, uh, yours are not under any pressure. Lambs are starting to grow, starting to, you know, uh, about a kilo uh, towards the end of mid-pregnancy. But there's a huge rise in uh, growth from seven weeks. So in the final seven weeks of pregnancy, there's 75% of fetal growth. So this is why we need nutrition the yo is uh, starting to get under pressure and need nutrition to, to, to fill this gap. You can see here from week 12, um, the yo is starting to grow the lamb, very little pressure on that yo. Um, intakes are not compromised and the yo can uh, fill herself uh, with, with, with ease. Then in week 20, you can see that uh, that yo is starting to grow a lamb, possibly two lambs. Um, you know, could be up on five kilos each, and then you have a birth uh, fluid of maybe seven kilos there. So that's really impinging on the rumen. It's reducing the capacity of the rumen, and it's um, this is where your meal needs to come in to make sure that the yolk is getting enough nutrition to maintain herself, uh, produce glostrum, and grow, grow healthy lambs. So a, a huge step in. Um, Nutrition then as well is, is what ration to feed and where does that start? So it starts with your silage quality. Uh, the main measure that we look in silage quality would be DMD or dry matter digestibility. And you can see from this sample here, it stands at 69.2%, uh, so almost 70%, which would be representative of a lot of samples that um, would be on ground at the minute. Um, you can see the dry matter is high at 29%, so this would be a very dry silage sample. And then pH and ammonia, 4.4 and 6.6, .6, good signs of uh, fermentation. Crude protein, slightly low, 12%, but you'll be supplementing these yolks anyway, so the, the, the crude protein will be will, will rise in. So what to look for, for in your ration? So there's a 60% increase in energy and protein in the final two weeks of pregnancy. So if you take your energy, for example, your dry yo needs uh, 0.8 of UFL uh, just to maintain herself. And that rises up to 1.4 UFLs just before pregnancy. And then likewise with protein, um, a dry yo needs 130 grams of protein, uh, a dry yo. And then in the final two weeks, 
um, or in the lead up to pregnancy, uh, it's 215 grams. So there's huge demands on energy and protein in the final two weeks. Um, you want to feed a 19 to 20% crude protein ration. So ideally, that's what you want to feed. Um, crude protein is hugely important uh, for colostrum production. And you want to select a ration based on quality and not on cost. So just because there's a cheap ration in the co-op doesn't necessarily mean that it's good quality. Uh, the top four ingredients in are hugely important. So ideally, you'd like to see uh, soya in your top three ingredients because uh, the higher up there in your list, the more inclusion rate they have in the, in the feed. You can see on the right here at the table, the high energy feeds, medium energy and low energy. So you're talking for high energy, your cereals, your maize, barley, oats, sweets, your pulps, your soybean is you know, a good source of energy, but hugely important for protein. Again, distillers, grains, peas, beans, molasses, and oil. And then the medium energy, you're talking about your maize gluten and sciholes. Sciholes are a good source of uh, fiber. And then your rapeseed meal as well. And then your low energy feeds is which, you know, you don't want to see these high up in your uh, list from, from the ration, uh, low inclusion rates, and, and definitely not in the first three to four ingredients. Your wheat feed, palm kernels, sunflower, sunflower uh, oat feed, and cottonseed. So pre laminar nutrition, then, if we just take 75 kilo yo, for an example, on 70 DMD silage, which is the, the sample that we had, and you're giving her that 19 to 20% crude protein concentrate. So from the table below, you can see on the left, the scanned litter size. So the O is carrying a single, a double, or a triple. Um, then the weeks per um along the top here, and the how much you're starting to feed them when you're stepping them up each week as they become closer to lambing. So if you just take that 75 kilo yo carrying a single lamb, you start feeding her five to six weeks out from lambing with 200 grams. Uh, three to four weeks out, 400 grams, and a week to two weeks before lambing, 600 grams, and our total intake of 17 kilos. Um, the same yo then, if she was carrying doubles, we start to feed her uh, 78 weeks out with 200 grams, stepping her up at five to six weeks out with 400 grams, three to four weeks, 600 grams, and a week to two weeks before lambing, 800 grams, giving her a total intake of 28 kilos. And then if the yo is carrying triplets, uh, start feeding her again 78 weeks out, but you're stepping it up again, 400 grams, uh, five to six weeks out, 600 grams, three to four weeks out, 800 grams, and a week to two weeks before lambing, 800 grams, giving her a total intake of 36 um, kilos. So the better quality silage that you have, the lower amount of meal that you'll have to feed and the less time that you'll have to feed it for. Colostrum production then. So pre laminar nutrition drives colostrum production, so it's hugely important. Um, as a guide, 100 grams of soybean per head per day per scanned lamb in the final three weeks. So that's the target. Now, if you're feeding a 20% crude protein ration, the yo's are getting that anyway. So uh, it's, just a big, it's just a guide and just keep in mind if you are feeding yo's, lead up to lambing. Um, it's a huge driver of colostrum, as I said earlier. And, you know, quantity wise, you want one liter uh, of colostrum per lamb born in the first, first 24 hours. And then, of course, the colostrum that you have, you want a good quality. So you want your nutrition right. Um, and the quality of the colostrum will be good if the nutrition is right then. Feed management then. So you want to keep clean, fresh feed in front of the O's at all times. So you're trying to maximize their intakes. And, um, you know, you're talking about in and out in front of the O's, you know, twice a week at least, but ideally more than that to make sure that their intakes will be maximized. Um, above a half kilo per head per day, you want to feed that twice and consistent feeding times I've down there. So, you know, you're talking about eight hours at least between feeds. So if you're feeding at nine o'clock in the morning, you're talking about feeding again at five o'clock in the evening, and you're trying to keep that consistent in the lead up to pregnancy. So uh, O's have a water requirement of six liters of water per day. Now it could be higher than that, depending on uh, the ration that you're feeding and how dry the forage you have. But uh, you know you want to make sure that you always can quench their thirst every time they go to the straw, and um, that the water, as a rule of thumb, is as clean as if you drink yourself, so that the oils will have good access to water and um, can satisfy their thirst every time, like I said. 
Um, you want to remove uh, shy feeders in as well. So if yours are at the backs of pins and not inclined to come to forward, you need to remove them, feed them on their own, make sure that they're getting adequate nutrition. You could have a lame yo, likewise needs to be removed, or you could have a yo that's overindulgent or bullying other yo's, and you know that should, she should be removed as well then, and make sure that they're getting adequate nutrition, that they're not overeating, but that they're getting enough. Space requirements then, so hugely important, um, your pin floor space and your feeding space. So if we just take a, a large O90 kilos on slats, uh, she needs 1.2 meters squared. Um, if the same yo is on bedding, uh, so straw or other material, it's 1.4 meters squared. A medium yo, 70 kilos, 1.1 meters squared on slats and 1.2 on bedded. And a small 50 kilo yo, um, one meter squared on slats and 1.1 on bedded. So, you know, slightly higher there where your bedding yo's on straw or um, other material. Uh, feeding space then hugely important. So like I said, the chances are you're going to be feeding more, uh, very nearly all yo's meal. So a large yo, 90 kilos, then it's 600 millimeters where she's been fed with meal. Um, a 70 kilo yo, 500 millimeters where she's been fed meal. And a small yo, 50 kilos, uh, 400 millimeters where she's been fed me meal. Now, if the yo's are just getting roughage, it's uh, 200 millimeters for the 90 kilo yo, 200 millimeters for the 70 kilo yo, and 175 for the 50 kilo yo. Um, it's hugely important, if you can see down the pictures here on the bottom, uh, this pinion is very common throughout the country. And it's just to be always observe your yo's when you're feeding them. Ideally, you want to measure those pins and make sure that yo's have enough space to feed and, and that they can all feed at the one time. Now, these corners are have caused problems in the past. So if you can see um, a yo that's eaten out to the left, so where she's feeding out to the left, she's actually blocking two yo's uh, from feeding at the front here of the barrier. So that's a problem. Um, if yo's are not able to, to eat all together, then some of them are going to get more than others and some of them possibly nothing at all. So hugely important to observe the yo's when they're feeding. And uh, if there's a shy yo, uh, you know, remove her, make sure that she's getting adequate nutrition. So was your nutrition correct? Well, if we got the body condition score right, if we got our nutrition right, if we got our classroom right, um, and you weigh your lambs at birth, then these targets with these target weights should be achieved. So for a low land, a single uh, lamb will be six kilo. Um, Wins would be five kilos and triplets four, four kilos. So that's the target for lowland, lowland sheep. And then for hill sheep, a single lamb would be five kilos and a twin lamb would be four kilos. So that's how you know you've got your nutrition correct. If it's not correct, at least you can correct it for next year. But if you don't weigh, then you won't know. So just in summary then, um, hugely important to keep an eye on body condition score. Look, any chance that you have through the year, if you can check body condition score of yours, you should um, avoid doing it in late pregnancy because, you know, you don't want to upset yours. But uh, hugely important to make sure, sure that yours are going to land down ideally at a condition score of three. Scan your yours then and, you know, find out how many lambs they're carrying. Pin your yours according to this and feed them accordingly. Quality ration. So make sure that the ration that you're buying is of good quality and it's not just a cheap ration. Uh, 18 or 19 to 20% crude protein with soya bean as the main protein source, which we're looking for there. Uh, observation at feeding. So make sure that lambs, or sorry, that sheep will um, can all feed at the same time. That if there's any shy uh, sheep, remove them and uh, make sure that they're getting, they're all getting the same level of feed. And then check for your correct nutrition. So weigh your lambs if there's, um, if there is improvements to be made for next year, at least you'll know. But if you don't weigh, then you won't know. So that's it for me. I'll hand you back to Brenda now and I can take any questions at the end.
thank you very much there, Nolene, for that detailed explanation of your nutrition. I'll just get you just to stop your, uh, sharing your presentation for a moment. And uh, just while we're changing over there to James, uh, we have a lot of farmers on tonight, over 120 farmers uh, logged on. So uh, maybe, you know, we might have some questions there from the floor and indeed from Liam's presentation there. So put your questions in there in the Q&A tab. And after James's presentation, uh, we will get uh, Vivian then to put your questions live to James and Aleem. So uh, over to you now, uh, James, in the studio. Thank you very much for that, James. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. James Fitzgerald is my name, and I'm working here in Chagas and Balna. And um, Liam has gone through a lot there on, you know, your nutrition and that um, that aspect of preparing for lambing, and that's very important. That's probably the single most important thing when it comes to um, preparing for lambing. So what I'll just do in my presentation now is I'll touch on some of the other aspects that you need to get right as well, okay, apart from nutrition. So um, what, what can, really what I'm going to focus on first of all is just um, mortality in lambs and how we can cut down on mortality in lambs, okay. Um, so first of all, what, what influences mortality? As you can see here on screen, there's a number of different aspects that influences how many lambs you're going to lose. Look, at you're always going to have a certain percentage of um, lamb losses in any year, but um, really reducing lamb losses in as far as possible is really, um, it's look, it's just going to add extra lambs for sale, okay? So it's just important to lose as few as you can. Um, so lamb losses can occur from a range of different things. You can see here, nutrition has a role to play. Apart from that, metabolic disorders, like maybe deficiencies in the O's diet or... Um, deficiencies are in how the oats are being fed if they're not being fed properly that can cause lamb losses okay through a range of metabolic diseases or disorders um hygiene has a lot to do with how many lambs are going to be lost so in a lot of cases so i'm going to be touching on that a good bit now over the next few minutes um so you'll see that uh diseases um Look, at lambs can pick up a number of different diseases from the environment. And again, it comes down, that's kind of linked in with hygiene. So that's uh, kind of all part of the one point. Genetics, uh, maybe it's a smaller proportion of lambs, but a small proportion of lambs each year might be lost due to, you know, what they call congenital defects or deformities or that kind of thing. So uh, by and large, that's unavoidable and it's just a freak thing. But sometimes it can have a, a, you know, a genetic element to it. Um, and overall management then as well, how much time you can put into your, um, you put in while lamb and sheep is obviously going to influence how many lambs you lose. Okay, so um, better management or even more focused management often can lead to better results when it comes to reducing lamb mortality. So um, we know that over half of the lambs that don't make it as far as, um, as sale, basically half the lambs that are lost between scanning and sale or that uh, die within the first 24 hours of life. So basically, if a lamb makes it past um, the first day of life, they have a very good chance of uh, making it the whole way to slaughter. So we should really focus in on that period of time or around the lambing time, okay? Um, so it's possible to achieve 10% or less mortality to waning. Um, which is a good target for any farmer to aim for. And even maybe farmers out there that scan at higher rates, lowland flocks scanning up around two or even a small bit above it, um, even 15% itself would be a very good target for mortality um, in lambs because we know that uh, triplet bearing ewes or triplet lambs have a high, far higher mortality rate than what doubles or singles would have. Okay, so 10% um, broadly would be a good target and even 15% for a high lamb and flock. Um, so really, I suppose if we're going to try and improve our mortality rates and cut down on the amount of lambs that are being lost, we firstly need to try and quantify our, what, why are they being lost or for what reasons? And that can vary from farm to farm, okay? So um, I suppose, where you might start out with something like this and it isn't exactly the most joyful task that you'll undertake in any spring but it, it still it could be a very good idea to maybe 
do a tally on lambs that are lost. Figure out what percentage of lambs you're losing in any given spring and see if there's scope for you to improve on that for a start, okay? You have to accept that there's, there's going to be some losses, but maybe if you did a tally on it, maybe you'd see that there would be scope to improve to some extent, okay? And also, if as well as that, if you can tally up why lambs are being lost, if you can sort of diagnose what reason lambs uh, the bulk of lambs on your farm are being lost well then you'll know some you'll have better direction again as to what to hone in on okay so that um, that whole concept was kind of put into practice in Athen right there a few years ago there was a trial done uh, back around 2018 and even the years leading into that where every lamb um, that died around lamb and time was sent to the lab for post-mortem okay and um the results of that came back uh, and you can see it here in this pie chart so it just breaks down different reasons why lambs were lost and the prevalence of that okay so i suppose if you've sent lambs to um a veterinary lab uh, you, you might know that like joe there is um a chance that they will come back with no distinct diagnosis or no di diagnosis reached as to why the lamb lost and you can see that in the yellow section there around 28 percent of lambs that were sent from math and right didn't have they didn't come back with a definite result, okay? So apart from that then, uh, dystochia accounted for about 15%, malpresentation and just, um, you know, lambs too big to be born or coming backwards, a large lamb coming backwards, that type of thing accounted for about 15% of lambs, which is dystochia just overall is just um, difficulty lambing, okay? Um, and at smaller percentages, you can see there in the green up near the top of the pie chart, accidental deaths accounted for 8% of deaths, which would, you know, be kind of, um, it wouldn't be limited to, but it would include kind of maybe the yo lying on top of one of our lambs or that type of thing, which can be, you know, um, one thing that might be linked to that is the size of the lamb and pin. The size of the lamb and pin, if it's bigger, that reduces the, the likelihood of that, but it can't be ruled out entirely. And congenital defects at 3%, that again is what I was talking about earlier, just um, deformed lambs that aren't really viable, okay? But uh, by fair and large, the biggest proportion of the lambs that were sent to the lamb came back, or sent to the lab came back with um, infection, just general infections as the cause of death, okay? So if, if, that, if it's the same for your farm, if you have a hunch that it's the same for your farm, it could be um, very much worthwhile in focusing on hygiene on your farm, um, in the lamb and shed, if you're lambing inside particularly, focusing on hygiene in the shed um, and also focusing on colostrum and making sure that each lamb gets um, enough of colostrum in time when it's born uh, to ensure that its immune system is built up to the standard required to cope with the infections it needs, okay? Um, so just around hygiene in the lamb and shed and that kind of thing, really hygiene comes down to making sure the environment is as clean as possible and make sure that there's as little infection or in infectious agents like bacteria and that kind of thing coming into contact with your lambs or your yos um, around lamb and time. So um, how practically how you do this on farm is just use plenty of straw and don't spare it, okay? Straw is good and dry and clean and it reduces the the amount of bacteria your lambs are going to come in contact with and also if you're cleaning out lamb and pins use plenty of lime as well which is acts as a sterilizing agent killing bacteria and drying up the environment as well okay so plenty of straw and plenty of lime is where you start and this will minimize the risk of harmful bugs in the environment okay um, and also on top of that, then try and have as good a ventilation as you can in your sheds. Now that's off, often, you know, easier said than done, but uh, having good ventilation is key because um, fresh air is, it's for free and it's as good a disinfectant as a lot of other stuff. Okay. So if you can make sure that the environment is, is as dry as possible and as there's as much fresh air as possible, uh, bacteria will find it harder to survive in that, in that um, environment. Okay. So outside of, you know, bedding well and using clean straw and lime and good ventilation, um, the next thing we need to focus on then really is to make sure that the lamb and equipment, the equipment, any equipment that we use at lamb and time and anything that comes into contact with uh, the inside of a yo or comes into contact with a lamb is sterilized well and cleaned often and is as hygienic as possible. So that would include... Um, 
you know, the likes of maybe ropes that you might be using or a laminate or that kind of thing. Um, gloves that you're using to hand, handle yours with. Always use a, a clean, fresh glove, new glove for each yo and don't use the same glove on two different yo's because you can transfer infection between the two yo's. And, um, you know, the likes of stomach tubes and bottles and teeth and all that kind of stuff. We need to find a, a quick and easy way of keeping this stuff sterile and disinfected because um, we're going to be tight for time. Everyone is going to be tight for time during the lamin period and we mightn't have all day for scrubbing these utensils either. So um, just with that in mind, uh, this this is probably the simplest um way of of achieving that of achieving you know clean lamb and utensils it's just three different buckets okay and they all contain cold water so there's no hot water needed um just three buckets of cold water and in the first uh, bucket there also is a uh, washing up liquid so this is going to be your main you know washing bucket that you're going to use this bucket to wash any equipment first off okay um that you, after you use it okay and in the second bucket then it's just clean cold water and nothing else so you'll just use that maybe to rinse off any excess suds or anything like that from the first bucket okay and uh the third bucket then will have a sterilizing agent in it as well as the cold water okay so there's a number of them out there on the market and they're you know it's just a matter of when you finish washing and rinsing off the the lamb and utensils just steep them in that bucket okay just leave them in that bucket basically for a minimum of 15 minutes until the sterilizer has worked but basically you can just leave leave whatever it is in that bucket until you need it again and um just you, you go you know where it is then when it comes time to use it again you know exactly where where you're going to find it and you know that it's going to be clean okay so um when it does come time to maybe use for example of um you know, a uh, stomach tube again, and you take it from that bucket, there's no need to rinse it off again with um, water or anything like that. The sterilizing agent, once you shake off the ex the excess sterilizing um, agent off it, it's, it, it can be used straight away, okay? So it can be filled immediately with milk or colostrum or whatever it is, okay? So that's just a simple um, way of keeping uh equipment sterile and um in a fit state for purpose okay and it's it's quite simple to set up um so moving on from keeping things hygienic and clean and moving more towards maybe colostrum and how you manage that and how much colostrum a lamb needs to get um really a rule of thumb is um that each lamb will need to get 50 milliliters of colostrum per kilo of body weight every six hours okay so that's a that's a difficult stat to remember so if we just multiply that out into something more simpler that's easier to remember for your generic you know five kilo lamb your average five kilo lamb when born um he's going to need to drink a liter of colostrum or milk in, in the first day of life okay which is quite a large um quantity of milk and obviously, from what Liam was saying earlier on, um, through your, your nutrition and getting, you know, colostrum production levels in the yo correct, we're going to be, you know, hoping that, at least anyway, uh, that the yo will do a lot of the heavy lifting for us in that regard. So really, what, what we, when we need to keep this stat in mind is really when we have a situation where a yo for whatever reason is unable to feed our lambs or if there's you know a triplet born and the yo doesn't have enough of colostrum for all of them or that type of thing okay so just bear in mind that um if you're supplementing colostrum or if you're feeding colostrum to lambs the quantity that they need okay and the quantity that a yo is capable of supplying when she's um fed properly okay um a couple other small bits on that, I guess, if you, for again, for example, if you have a yo that has rat lambs down and has a triplet and she only has enough of colostrum for maybe one or two lambs, um, you should try and aim to get some of the yo's colostrum into each lamb for a start and then top up if needs be with artificial colostrum for each lamb, okay? Um, so in that case, each lamb has got some colostrum from its own mother, which is uh, it's it's just more advantageous okay because if you were to feed all of the colostrum to the first lamb or two from the o and then make up um artificial colostrum 
just for the third lamb. Well, then the third lamb won't have got the same antibodies into a system that would be specific for the diseases prevalent on your farm um, that the first two lambs would have got and his immune system could, could be compromised going forward. So try and get at least some your colostrum into each lamb. And if you have to top up, then um, do so accordingly, okay? Um, another aspect of, you know, some lambs, especially in harsher springs in bad conditions outside, these would be older lambs now than, than the stage where you'd be feeding colostrum. These lambs might be a few days old, weather turned very wet and cold and that kind of thing. You might end up in a situation where you might be getting lambs that would get hypothermia outside and they kind of go into a, a state of a kind of a coma or the kind of shock okay so um if you get a lamb like this out the field uh how, how you go about bringing that lamb back um is that you have to try and get glucose uh, solution into the lamb and preferably into the lamb's um intestines as quick as possible so as you can see in the second photo there the bottom photo that can be injected directly into the lamb where, where you get this is it comes in a in a packet of um, kind of sugar type substance called de dextrose, okay? And you dilute that down maybe to a 20% solution. So for each um, for each 100 mils of it you'd make, you, you'd use 80 mils of, you know, um, cool boiled water um, and 20 grams of, of this uh, dextrose, okay? So you put the, you, you inject it into the lamb's abdomen then in through um, basically, you go one inch to the side and one inch down from the navel and, and aim the needle back towards the top of the lambs or the, the tail head of the lamb. OK, and if you um, inject it in there, <clears throat> you can uh, you can put that lamb under a red lamp then and within a half an hour, he should be more or less back to, you know, himself again and in a state where you can feed him some colostrum and, or some milk and get him going again. OK, it's just a. What has happened is the lamb has gone over hungry, the yo hadn't enough milk to keep him going, and he's um he's just gone into a coma from that. I suppose if you're not comfortable with the, attempting to inject it into the lamb, um you can uh give it by stomach tube as well to the lamb, the same solution if, if you're careful. Um and then you you'll have to wait for an hour for for it to get into the lamb system first of all before you go heating them. So if you're going to give it by stomach tube, you're better off to not put the lamb under the red lamb for about an hour and then put them under it. You might it mightn't be just as successful, but if you're not comfortable with injecting, look at it's still better off to try it because by the time the lamb has got to this stage, you're into um you're you're just trying to save the lamb anyway, okay. So um, again, just circling back to what I said at the very start, if you're going to keep a tally of why lambs are going to, are being lost on farm, um, really we're going to need to be able to um, diagnose why lambs are, are dying. Okay, and this might be for for a lot of the people on the call, this might be you know a very simple thing for them, but just being able to break down and diagnose different illnesses and being able to split them into different you know, types of diseases. Is it an abortion problem? Like what would often happen in the last couple of weeks before lambing, like toxoplasmosis or enzootic abortion, would it um, cause sheep to abort and they'd cause a lot of lamb losses? They can be vaccinated against fairly easily if you get a good vaccine program in place. Or are they metabolic diseases like um, you know, twin lamb disease, milk fever, prolapse due to, you know, the way sheep are being fed, maybe all metabolic diseases are either caused by a deficiency in the lamb's diet or a um, or a deficiency in the yo's diet, I mean, or some sort of irregularity in how they're being fed, okay? Uh, infections like what I've gone through there, such as joint ill, navel ill, watery mouth scour are all, you know, largely preventable by getting enough of colostrum into the lamb in time making sure the colostrum is good enough for quality through your nutrition and making sure that the environment the lamb is in for the first few days if lambing inside is as hygienic as possible and um, then obviously there's going to be a, a smaller proportion of you know uh, defective la or you know um, genetic defects in lambs and that kind of thing which can cause lamb loss as well so just be able to you know break down these different diseases into different categories and know 
what you what direction you need to go in order to be able to reduce these land mortalities going forward okay so just i suppose in um in summary really uh just try and be as prepared as possible uh, for the lambing season ahead. It'll be another, you know, a few weeks before the bulk of lambs start being born on farms. So now might be a very good um, time to just maybe take stock of what you need for the spring ahead. Go out and buy it now and don't be looking for it um, and making a trip to the town to get it the day you need it. OK, when you're when things are a lot busier than they are now. So do out a list of what you need and go and have it in stock before you need it. OK, um, have enough of lamb and pins. OK, one lamb and pin per eight yos in the flock. And if you've less than that, well, then it's going to put pressure on um on the system on you and it's going to be hard to have enough of lamb and pins for yours as they're lambing. Use plenty of lime and straw both are cheap for what they can achieve to, in order to reduce infections and reduce lamb mortality try and get that three bucket system set up for yourself now in time so that you know that all the utensils you're using will be clean um, and put a plan in place to ensure each lamb gets adequate colostrum be that um, go on and have an artificial colostrum in stock for lambs or maybe if find a way of if you can find excess colostrum from a yo or that kind of thing that you can you know milk that out maybe and have it in the freezer or have it in stock some way so that it's wanting maybe later on in lamb and time when it's needed okay so uh just on a side note then apart from uh preparing for lamb and that kind of thing uh just a quick maybe refreshers on the on the sheep um sheep improvement scheme so a lot of you might have um or a lot of you hopefully have uh, applied for this scheme the deadline for it was back there in the first week of January. Um, so it's a follow on for one follow on from what was the sheep welfare scheme and the payment rate for it this year is a, and for the next five years, it's a five year scheme is 12 euros per breed and your per reference yo you have. OK, so uh, you have to complete two welfare measures very similar to the previous scheme that went ahead of it. Um, they're slightly different for lowland flocks and hill flocks, but uh, you pick two out of a possible five or six um, measures that are all geared towards improving sheep welfare. Um, but also, there is um, this wasn't in the previous scheme, but it is in this new scheme. As part of the new scheme, you have to buy a ram of high genetic merit some st at some stage in the first three years of the scheme, okay? And at the time of the application, you would have specified what year you're going to buy that ram in. So you need just to make sure that you buy a ram that's either four or five star in a sale um, or at home, obviously just four or five star genetic merit uh, during the year that you said you would in the first three years of the scheme. And if you have over 150 euros, there'll be a requirement there to buy a second ram as well later in the scheme, okay? Um, so you must maintain uh, necessary records there'll be a book sent out to you for you to record your records in and make sure that you retain receipts uh, associated with the measures that you picked um so you ha also have to maintain the required number of breeding yos during the scheme if you have a reference number of 100 yos okay you need to make sure that you have at least 100 yos on farm at all stages for the next five years okay and if your yo numbers drop below that at, at any given time uh, you have to notify the department okay that your yo numbers have reduced and they'll be okay with that as long as it's flagged with them okay um so so you also need to submit a sheep census each year and the uh, postage deadline for that was actually yesterday for the 2022 sheep census. So um, the online uh, deadline is for the very same for the 2022 sheep census is the 14th of February. You have until the 14th of February to send it in online. So for if whatever reason you forgot to send it in, postal, uh, post it in, um, maybe you have until the 14th of February to get that job done. Okay. So. Um, that's it from me. Uh, thanks very much. I'll just hand you back to Brendan now again. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them if I can. So thanks very much. So I'd just get you to stop sharing your presentation there, James. And yep. uh, at this stage, I'll also call on Vivian and Liam there to, uh, to come on there for our questions and answers. Uh, lots of questions there are actually flood flooding in there. So time to get uh, still questions uh, submitted if you wish. And uh, it's over to you now, Vivian. And uh, Vivian Silka, Regional Manager here for County Mayo. 
Thanks, Brendan, and uh, thanks to, J to James and Liam for presenting there. Plenty of questions coming in, and we'll take them as, as we're going through them as well. So, um, Liam, or sorry, James, we'll let you catch your bit there for a minute. I have a question for, for, for Liam. It, well, I don't think it was specifically covered in the presentation, but maybe, Liam, you can give an insight into it. So, lick buckets, um, are, are they useful for a, for a pre-lactating yolk, or what's your view on it? Yeah, so look at um, the, the lick buckets have a, a part to play, um, especially, you know, if you're feeding up uh, the mountain or something like that, where it's not as easy to get up with uh, concentrates. I'm inclined to feed concentrates where I can, but they definitely do have a, a part to play. Um, yeah, that's... Okay, that's what okay. It's. Thanks, Liam. And another one which is related to the diet as well. Um, have you any advice on how to make soya more palatable as a supplement in the commercial ration? Um, because I know some yos when they're eating it, they'll they'll maybe if you're adding soya directly to the ration, which some people do in the last maybe week, uh, there might be soya in the ration, but some people add whole soya by bags of soya and add it as well. Some yos aren't too gone in it. So uh, any any um tips on how to get it into them at at, the, at that stage? I suppose uh, the main the main way of feeding it would would be um, either in a nut form, as in the basic meal, or, a, or a, maybe a coarse form. So probably a, a tip, tip there, Lee. Yeah, so look at you, what you could do with that instance is just add a small bit of molasses to the feed, just to uh, sweeten it up a bit. That'll get the yolks going again, and um, uh, it'll make it a lot more palatable. Um, yeah, a bit, bit of molasses. Okay, okay, and there's a question here then, just one more question for you, Lee, you know. Um, what minerals, if any, do, do you recommend to give yours uh, close to lemon time? Yeah, that's hugely important, actually. Yeah. Um, the minerals are hugely important. So you're talking about, I suppose, first of all, uh, you want to find out if you have mineral deficiency. So you can do that by getting uh, forage analysis. It will tell you if your silage is deficient in any minerals. And if you thought it was a problem after that, you could test your yours blood sample them to find out if there's any deficiencies. But you're talking about the likes of your calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, sodium, there's loads of them. And then, you know, your trace elements, then as well, not to forget about them, your copper, iodine, zinc, all hugely important, but uh, minerals. Now, they're in the feed as well. There's an inclusion in the feed, but just if you have a problem, it's important to, to get more minerals into them. Okay. okay. Um, James, one or two questions coming in for you there now. Um, the first one is, you mentioned uh, the vaccination program or possibly something in, the, in those lines. And I know we're not we're not promoting one brand over another, but uh, the question here is what vaccines do you recommend, James, in terms of pre when you mentioned toxoplasmosis and so on? So uh, any common ones that come to mind? Um, yeah, I suppose, look, at the best person you can talk to is your vet about this anyway, for a start anyway. Um, so if you're in any doubt, um, get on to your vet and he can do a good plan up for you as to what to vaccinate for. Um, but I suppose the most common things that, that sheep farmers vaccinate against is the abortion ones. It's in zo in zootic abortion and toxoplasmosis, okay? So um, that would be probably more common if you're retaining all of your own replacements and that kind of thing, you might not be vaccinating against those and you might not have a need to vaccinate against them. But if you're in a situation where you're losing lambs at maybe just the run into lambing time, the last week or that kind of thing, or in the, that'd be usual toxoplasmosis, um, yours at a bart and the lambs just about wouldn't be strong enough to survive. And the normal enzootic abortion then is it's a real nasty one to come across at lambing time and it can it can spread like wild through fire through a flock as well it's where sheep usually just won't open up to lamb at all and and it causes huge problems at lambing time so look at you can probably put it put a good vaccination plan in place there and talk to your vet you'd probably be able to do it for 10 euros a year probably um, so the, the one you mentioned there, James, the most prevalent one or one of the common ones is toxoplasmosis. If yeah. if you go out tomorrow morning and you're a mid-season lemon flock and you, you discover an abortion in any in, in O, either out in the field or in the shade, are we too late to do anything now for the incoming flock that's going to lamb? Or is there some, some um, quick action we can get in there to, to, to try and prevent that going forward? No, you're, you're not too late. Again, talk to your vet about it. But I, I think if you give long-acting antibiotic in a case like that to yours it often helps prevent the the symptoms of toxoplasmosis for the later yours that are going to lamb okay so again talk to your vet about that but i think that could be a good help at that stage if you want to try and firefight for the rest of the lambing period 
Okay, and and more, one, a couple of the more common ones that, that I suppose our listeners and viewers will will use to the Heptavec and the Covexin. There's generally kind of preamble periods to give that so that the the O's will take it up in in the colostrum in the colostrum and produce it for the lambs, as you said yourself in presentation for maybe diseases that are prevalent in in on the farm. So I think. Um, from, from from my own experience, about four to five weeks pre laminus when you should be using those maybe as as, as low as three weeks. Have you any any up to date information that James? No, I think that's accurate. It's, uh, if you can give the the clostridial diseases vaccine at that stage, the antibodies will come through uh, in the cl- yours colostrum through in to the, the milk, Yeah. 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 So. Okay, and as you said, and you covered it at length in your presentation, very important to get an even amount into each lamb, if especially if they have three. Yeah, and and I suppose follow the recommendations on the manufacturer's docket that will be in the bottle, as in the you know the amount of time that needs to be given uh, for the for the antibodies to sorry for the vaccine to work in, in the O's pre lambing. Now, one question was come in just a couple of seconds ago. There, James is on the uh, sheep welfare scheme that you mentioned. And there's a bit of confusion out there, um, and I think uh, it, it's 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 prevalent enough to be honest. A few questions I've got myself on it. Um, so a farmer was has has been in the previous scheme, the the the, the last sheep scheme, and has a four to five star on the farm already. Will that do him for the new scheme? He's just entered in, in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure, but I don't think it does. I think a ram has to be purchased. If any, the rest of you have any yeah, info yeah, on that, I think uh, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far yeah. as I know, I think, yeah, Liam is not... As far as I know, in the in in the new scheme, uh, in the first three years, you must nominate a year to purchase the ram. So if you have one already, um, the, unfortunately, that won't count because you, you had him before you joined the scheme. And one of the conditions of the scheme is in the first three years to buy a four to five star genotype ram. Uh, and you must nominate the year. Now, I know the farm organizations are working away in the background to give more flexibility to the particular year, because I know um, when you join pre-Christmas there, or just after, in the, into the new year, I think the closing date was extended the 9th of January, but um, you had to nominate the, the year and get to stick to that year. But I know in the background, the farm organizations are um, trying to get more flexibility there uh, so that you, in one of the three years, uh, you will be allowed to buy the RAM, but they're walking away in that, so we'll, we'll see where that takes us. Um, another question for you here, Liam. What would the pros and cons be in feeding fodder beet, or have you any experience of that, two in lamb yours? Um, it's not something that I have had experience of, but it's just, I suppose, you know, uh, fodder beet is a very palatable feed. You just want to watch their intakes, that they're not going to take in too much, and then, you know, lead into prolapse or anything like that. Um, but, you know, balance with uh, nutrition if you're, if you're feeding fodder beet. Yeah, and um, minerals being part very important as well. Yeah, minerals. Does, I, I think is it phosphorus? I just from memory, I think phosphorus is yeah, is, phosphorus is, 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 is 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 low in the in the fodder beef. Well, it is it is in cattle, so I presume so in sheep as well. Um, you touched on it there in your presentation as well, uh, James, in terms of prolapse and and the diet that can either kind of help with that issue or 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 bring it on. Have you any views on that in terms of the forage type? Because I, I I know some farmers are very very strong on one versus the other. Yeah, I I'd say a lot of farmers are over strong on on the effect that the forage has on on prolapse and in sheep. Usually, it, it, there I think there's a genetic element to it to an extent. Okay, so if you cull hard for prolapse and um and try and even ensure that your lambs out of yours that prolapse don't if you can at all don't keep them. You can you can weed it out of your flock to some extent, okay. Um, but from a feeding point of view, um, it's kind of more feed management, I think, more so than the forage type, okay. If you have enough of feed space and the sheep aren't forcing at the at at the, you know, at the feeders to try and get room to eat meal and to and to move around and that kind of thing, it's usually that that type of thing that causes more prolapse. Um. Now, a lot of farmers would um, be going down a route, maybe even restricting forage in the late stages of your pregnancy in order to try and, you know, not let forage take up so much room inside in the sheep, which would kind of maybe cause extra prolapse. But I, I think, t- to be honest, the the, the results of underfeeding sheep from restricting forage is 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 a bigger problem than the the prolapse really so it's probably in my view anyway counterproductive to try and limit forage 
Um, yeah. Thankfully, one of our viewers is more knowledgeable than myself. That just reminded me of the protein issues with fodder beet as well. So, um, I, I think fodder beet from memory is is lowish in in protein. So, yeah, it's only if, if, ten or eleven percent. So you'd need to be feeding uh, soybean along with that. Definitely. Yeah, and and watch for that as well. So, um, just two fresh ones that's coming in here. I just want to read them out for a minute before I go through them. Oh yeah, it's on the um again a question for you, James, in terms of the sheep improvement scheme. Just wondering if the reference number of yours for the sheep improvement scheme is the same as the reference number of yours in the previous sheep welfare scheme. Uh, you alluded to it in your in your last slide. Just maybe go back over that again, James, please. Um sorry, no, I'll share screen again. My last slide. Okay. So the question is, that the previous scheme that just has finished, uh, at the end of 2022, has it any bearing on the reference number of yours for 2023? No, um, no, no link between the two schemes in that regard. The Where your current um, your numbers or your reference number for this new scheme comes from, it's, it takes the last number of sheep censuses that you sent in, okay? Um, if you're a new entrant to farming or if you only sent in one uh, census so far, it just takes that. But if you've sent in a number of censuses over the last few years, it takes the highest three of the last five or six censuses and averages them. OK, so I think that's where your your um, reference number for this new scheme came from. And when you were applying, you would have had the opportunity to reduce that if you wanted, if you weren't planning on keeping them, your numbers going forward. Um, you, you had the chance to do that and if 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 it's just going forward if you're just deciding now that you might be keeping less your numbers than that if you notify the department they'll cut it down for you and they'll just pay you on the new reference number rate generally the department will will um cooperate with someone who tells them events of, of something happening you know yeah. if you write in and say i had 100 shows i applied for 100 shows but through, the, through this year, I'm down to 80 now. There won't, there won't be an issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the final question, uh, Liam. Just get which, you, just, James, yeah. just get you, maybe just a stop sharing your screen there for oh, yeah. one second, oh, yeah. James. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. And, and, and the last question, we'll just spend a minute on this because we're almost up for time. We'll try and finish at nine. Um, Liam, again, I suppose, depends on litter size and the condition of the yaws, which we take for granted, is, is good. Is rolled oats enough to feed yaws uh, six to eight weeks pre lending yeah, I'd say probably not. Like even um, the likes of your side being for pro for classroom productions, I was saying during the presentation, hugely important. Um, but it does depend on uh, litter size, and you know, perhaps maybe if you had them out on grass. But I'd still be inclined to get uh, protein into them just from a uh, classroom point of view. Yeah, generally your oats is about. 10, 11, 12% protein. So yeah, going on what you said, we're a little bit low there, so we have to supplement something. <laughs> Folks, thanks very much for all your questions. Uh, and I think the lads answered as much as we can. If we have missed one or two of them, which we may have, um, we, we get back to you uh, in the recording and bring, and bring us up to date with that. So thanks, thanks folks. Well, thank you very much, Vivian. And indeed, we're just about out of time this evening. I'd like to thank our two panellists here this evening, James and Liam, for excellent presentations. And indeed, uh, thanks to Vivian there for facilitating the questions and answers here tonight. And indeed, most importantly, but thanks to you at home for engaging with us this evening. And uh, we hope you found this webinar beneficial. We'll get the recording uploaded to the Chagas Mayo YouTube channel in the coming days. So keep an eye out for that. All that's left for me to say is that we'll be back here again next week for the second episode in this series, where my two colleagues from Chagas and Ballinrobe, Inter Maloney and Eamon Patton, will discuss in detail the structure of the new basic income support scheme, which affects all 115,000 farmers across the country, irrespective of enterprise. Uh, so that's definitely something to watch out for next week. And with that, it's good night from us all here in County Mayo and stay safe, folks. And we'll see you all again next week at 8 p.m. and the same link will work again. So good night from us all. Good night.